Thank you very much, Aretha, for joining in. And um, we have uh, in the background a wonderful duck pond, uh, as far as I've heard, in Wisconsin. <laughs> so thank you very much for, yeah, for accepting the invitation to this interview. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. So the first question is like, uh, who, who are you? Can you briefly introduce yourself? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, my name's Aretha Sills and I'm, as you can see, I'm in Northern Wisconsin in, um, Lucas asked me it was if it was snowing, so I moved over because it was actually blossoms falling off the trees. So you got a really good uh, peak spring moment here. Um, it's not going to look like that for long, but it's uh, it's quite nice. So I yeah I teach the improvisational theater games of Viola Spolin, um, which uh, were taught to me by my father Paul Sills, and Viola is known as the mother of improvisational theater in the United States. Um, she's the creator. Um, uh, of theater games, uh, which uh, she created uh, as a way um, to teach acting and not she um, and it came out of social work. She was a theater person, a, te a theater teacher, a theater director and a social worker. Um, and as she said, she was the only person who could have created theater games because she was a theater person and a social worker and she was working with what she called everyday average people. And um, she was teaching him theater and um, she, she realized the training that she got was not going to be helpful for her to impart to them the needs of the theater. As she said, the techniques of the theater are the techniques of communicating. Um, and so she created games because she had been trained by a wonderful social worker who believed in the uses of play in education and social work very progressive um, at the time. And, um, and and their work came out of the progressive era education movement and um, social activism. And then she had a son named Paul Sills, that was my dad, and he was the founder of the first improvisational theater companies in the United States, including the Compass. He was the founding director um, uh, of Compass and Second City and many other uh, theaters um, and beyond. And so I learned from him um, and uh, I teach theater games. Now, that sounds like a family tradition uh, to <laughs> <laughs> not only play theater, but also to teach improvisation. Yeah. The uh, mother of improvisation. Is it improvisation theater or is it improvisation as such for, you know, life and organizations? What is improvisation uh, from your point of view? Um, well, she, hello. Um, she, uh, you know, Viola called improvisation um, openness to contact with the environment and each other and willingness to play, right? So, um she certainly believed it was for more than the theater um in she because it came out of social work and she was very interested um in all the ways um improvisation could help people um in the therapeutic ways and the educational ways you know that uh, uh but her her book i'll show you her book this is the third edition um and the most recent and the important the, the one you know, we work from is improvisation for the theater, the third edition, she has many other books, actually, but this is sort of the, the main text, the first improvisational theater text, um, probably ever, uh, was originally published in 1963. And this is the most recent edition. For those of you who are hanging out for the, uh, uh, se the, the game session after this, we'll be working mostly from this book. So yeah, she, it, it emerged out of the theater and it's uh, her work is incredibly influential in the theater, but it has other applications. Her work is also, I should say, because it is about, it's group work, it's, um, it's also uh, at the heart of the devised theater movement um, uh, and a lot of educational theater that emerged out of the United States. And by devised theater, I mean, people who work together um, as a group to create theater um, not and then set it and uh, not necessarily they improvise it and then that's the show 
Um, so creating spontaneously as a group is in the very, um, is almost like my definition of improvisation. Now, uh, I hear like theater uh, and I hear games uh, and so on. So is this something for actors and actresses per se, or do you think that, that these mindset and skills are appropriate for different people, although they might perhaps not be in the theater? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, you know, of course, uh, it's, it's appropriate for actors and actresses, but um, but from, the, you know, play is uh, a, a, an, an innate human activity. You know, it's it goes uh, it goes deep in human history and it's something that we all all culture share. It connects everyone uh, and play does some amazing things for the human mind and the human body, <laughs> not just the mind. The mind and body are connected, right? Yeah. Um, it, 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 uh, play helps us enter the present time, which is very difficult for most of us to do. And so in that way, a lot of what, what Viola would call the ghostly voices, you know, the, uh, the um, strictures from the past can fall away when we play and allow us a state of openness to contact with the environment, as she said, that can solve a lot of problems, right? When we're not thinking about those things, we are, um, as she would say, you know, we're able to access our intuition. Now that they hook us up to, you know, um, uh, uh, machines to uh, 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 measure uh, brain activity and stuff like that, and they find that what what the brain does when we play, how it calms us, uh, and um, you know, we when we're being watched, you know, we're in that fight or flight stage. Um, I'm not going to explain the science. I'm just going to give you, you know, the, what we all know. Um, but uh, when we begin to focus. Um, the brain activity moves to the part of the brain that it, it, you know helps with creative problem solving and Viola was well aware of this, even if she didn't know the science because she watched human beings. <laughs> because she understood what human beings did you know how we behaved and what we needed, and so many of her games are really about calming us down to get us in a state of play so. Um, uh, a, a state of readiness, um, a state of focus, and then we could play. Um, and then, as she said, through spontaneity, we are reformed into ourselves. And once we are calm enough, all our sensory equipment is available to us, then we can access our intuition, our genius, and um, this solves many of our problems. It's not as easy to do as all that, but uh, but it can be. So um, how can you learn these skills? So I hear like uh, creative problem solving and being spontaneous. So it, it seems to be like skills that, that might be necessary for daily routine or being in a theater or um, even in, in business. But, but how can you learn that? Right, I know that's a really good question because it's one of those things. I remember um, someone gave my dad a book once when I was a kid and it was called you must relax you know and I remember thinking well that's <laughs> I know but. Uh, <laughs> uh, we can't just order people to relax, you know we have to <laughs> we have to learn how to do this, um, I think you know people are often tell me oh I could never come to your workshop, I could never do what you do in your workshop. Um, and of course, the very first words of Viola Spolin's book famously are everyone can act, everyone can improvise, anyone who wishes to can play in the theater and learn to become stage worthy. Wait, let me, let me get to you the next sentences, which don't as easily roll off my tongue. This is the chapter one, creative experience. We learn through experience and experiencing and no one teaches anyone anything. This is as true for the infant moving from kicking to crawling to walking as it is for the scientist with equations. If the environment permits it, anyone can learn whatever they choose to learn. And if the individual permits it, the environment will teach everything it has to teach. Talent or lack of talent have little to do with it. 
So when people say they can't come to my, they're too afraid, they can't come to workshop, they're making an assumption that improvisers are just sort of naturally witty and fearless and, <laughs> and don't need training to sort of work together as a group to create spontaneously. But, you know, we do, and um, we, we practice in safe, low risk workshops, right? Um, starting at the beginning with very simple children's games and sensory awareness exercises and learning experientially to work as part of the whole as part of a group you know it's um and through that all we learn all sorts of things that are good for human beings to know and one of them being that we need each other you know viola said play is democratic and that comes from the progressive tradition where she you know her her the people she studied with were um uh women who were social activists and really hoping to change the world and um, and get people to understand that we need each other and we need to know people who are not like us and we need to get to know them. You know, the great Jane Addams, um, the one of the leading lights of the progressive era was the founder of um, Whole House where all, you know, Viola was educated and luckily, uh, you know, lucky enough to land as a young first generation American girl. Now, um, the world changed not only the last year, but the last decades. The oldest falling lived in a very different uh, world than today. So, from your Maybe. point, of view, yeah, <laughs> so from your point of view, yeah, the world and the needed skills and so on changed. Do we still need, you know, all this playfulness and and uh, and being spontaneous and so on? Or, or is it even even more needed than before? So how, how yeah. what, what changed over the last years and decades regarding these skills? I, I feel like, you know, I mean, the world has changed and it's not changed. In some ways, every we, we're still here. So human beings have certain needs that remain the same no matter what. When I look at some of the pictures of Viola, I realized she and all her girlfriends were really modern, really forward thinking. They're dressed in men's clothing and wore red lipstick and they cut their hair short. And this is in the 1920s. I, um, those girls survived a pandemic, you know, uh, they were they were teenagers like right out of a pandemic and uh they were forward thinking right they were they want they were ready to go and i look at that picture and i see hope you know that we're hopefully we can we can come out of this with some new ideas right new ways of looking at the world but she you know and um it's it's if anything this experience um of of I, I had to move my workshops online really quickly, obviously um, make it work right at the, you know, in March of 2020, pretty soon after that, we were, we were you know, I had a class that got canceled. We were right in the middle of a performance workshop and we had to figure out what are we gonna do? And we just went online and, and worked it out, figured it out and we did our performance online and it all was such a wonderful way to keep us connected, you know, and getting us, I, we didn't we, we immediately approached it just like we wouldn't workshop like we're going to get up on our feet and play on our feet and we're going to build aware together and use space objects and bring ourselves all into the same space, even though we're all in these little uh, you know rectangles we can't get out of and passing space objects to each other between the frame and flying through the frame and all of that stuff. Um, it just was so unbelievably important in this year we felt the just the the sort of healing nature of this work in a way like I had never actually, you know, in a new way, you know, in, in a way I hadn't experienced before, even as it had been wonderful in person. So yeah, I, I feel like we are, um, it's still necessary uh, and, and helpful. And so even though the world has changed, her generation went through some pretty, um, difficult things and play was helpful to them and our generation can use the very same ideas even though the technology has changed we can still use the same old-fashioned ideas and it's interesting although i think like 100 years ago we would not have a zoom meeting or something similar um and, and now we can teach it you know worldwide uh, and so on um so 
what do you think if, if people you know attend uh, your workshops and, and, and make these exercises and then experience these these ideas and these games uh, to what extent do they change uh, what will they do perhaps differently than before in their daily life or organization life from your perspective that's a really good question. Um, I think one of the things is that they might feel freer to participate when they would have held themselves back before, because they, you know, we learn through play that it's okay to take risks. A lot of games are a lot more fun when we take risks. And in fact, messing up a game, making a mistake in a game is, is often part of the rules of a game. Like it's built in and it makes us all laugh and have fun and it frees us up. The, I, I you know, my main goal during a workshop is that people feel free to play and when they're free to play then they're going to uh, transcend their own limits and surprise themselves and surprise everyone so for me that's my goal as a teacher uh, and and we don't even call ourselves teacher in the Spolin tradition it's I'm a side coach <laughs> it's kind of like a third base coach in softball or um, so you know that they will learn I think that learn to trust themselves more, learn ways to calm themselves down so that when they are in a situation where they're being observed, whether it's an audience or another situation that makes in work where it makes them uncomfortable, um, they will learn how to calm themselves down and so that they can have all their faculties, all their sensory equipment uh, at the ready, which is what we all we need to um, to be uh to to solve problems creatively um and i think they'll learn to work together as part of a group in a more democratic way in a less hierarchical way uh, because we be really we we begin to understand through play that we're all necessary to play the game you know you can't uh you can't in a game become a, a dictator and tell everyone else what to do they'll just leave if you want everyone to you know if you want everyone to keep playing especially if you're a kid right you have to work it out and you have to make compromises and um and i think that's a really necessary skill in business um and i think it's about we learn to integrate other people's ideas into our um, and then we can explore and heighten those ideas until they come from the entire group. And then we've transcended all our limits. Really, we can find something truly new. So those are all the things I think, you know, and, and more. People tell me new things every day that they learn through workshop and it's so, so exciting. If you want to learn more about viola and the history of improvisational theater um, as it emerged in the United States, specifically in Chicago, right out of the progressive era, go to our website, it's violaspolin.org. And at the biography page, um, you can see, you can read more about her life. It's it's quite remarkable. Um, and I hope to work, I, I wrote this with my mom's help, and I hope to write a longer one or uh, at some point. Um, but here's some pictures of her as a young woman in Chicago. Here she is putting on a show with some of her girlfriends. Um, these are all most she was a Russian Jewish immigrant and she had fled uh, her her family had fret, had fled Russia because of anti Semitism here uh, so here's some of the girlfriends right uh, so this is the early 20s they would have survived the pandemic in 1918 and had been about like 12 when that happened and here you go, so I look forward to a flowering of. Uh, uh, of of the young of the youth after this I'm excited but he, this is Viola with the gun of course there she is and they all had nicknames like chick and spark and she was spark um, these are all you know sh Russian Jewish Chicago girls um, but they they pooled their money to buy this Model T Ford and they drove around this is up in Lake Geneva or something somewhere up in uh, Wisconsin and here's some more let's see and then. Um, let me find you. Here is her teacher, Neva Boyd, um, and a little more about her. She's a very important figure in the history of social work and improvisational theater. So I encourage everyone to learn more about her um, in the history of play. Here she is. This is my dad, Paul Sills, on her lap as a, a six-month-old baby um, in 1928, and he went on to be, you know, a founding figure of 
American Improvisational Theater. So this is a it's a really historic photo. I'm amazed that it exists, but it's here he is drinking at the mother's milk of play. Uh, you know, and uh, here's some more. Here's Viola uh, went to she had her kids really young and got divorced really young. Here's her first husband. And these um, she, she she was in night school at DePaul to learn about the theater. This is her Viola Sills. That was my um, grandfather's name. Who? And this is my dad, Paul, and his brother, Bill. This is the 1930s in Chicago. And here they are in a classic Chicago stoop, you know, kind of, or fire escape in the back. <laughs> I just love some of these pictures. Viola was always, um, she was so influenced by the progressive um, education she got at Hull House. Um, when she was a divorced single mom in the 1930s in Chicago, she and a bunch of other divorced uh, moms who were working um, got together and rented a big mansion. And it was during the depression so they could afford it if they all pooled their money. And she, they called it the educational playroom. And that way they were able to work um, and have their children be taken care of because they all took turns and they hired a cook um, and they were, uh, you know, lived right on Lakeshore Drive there next to Oscar Meyer's house. And here are some of the kids dressed up for Halloween. Um, but she really, you know, inside of her, you know, it, her work was a huge her letters are filled her work was the most important thing in her life beside her family but um but she never stopped getting groups of people together 